Hi, good morning, everyone, and welcome, <clears throat> excuse me, to New Jersey American Waters Monmouth County Irrigation Efficiency Webinar. We're so glad you could join us this morning. My name is Margaret Hunter, and I am an engineering manager at New Jersey American Water, and I'll be moderating today's presentation. We hope that our presentation will help you understand the importance of irrigation efficiency for our coastal north community and understand the importance to educate our customers in using water more wisely. We're very excited to have Robert Dobson here with us. He's a leading voice in the irrigation industry. Bob is the past president of the National Irrigation Association, the Irrigation Association of New Jersey, and the New Jersey Turfgrass Association. He's also a member of the New Jersey Landscape and Irrigation Contractors Examining Board. And from New Jersey American Water, we have Lindsay Olson. Lindsay is a senior director of our Coastal North Operations. She has over 23 years experience at American Water in positions involving water production management and leadership, water treatment and design, and construction. We will have the chat open for any questions you may have during the presentation. And I will be monitoring the chat to try to get as many questions as we can in the flow of the presentation to keep it interactive. And we should have time at the end for more. So now, before we begin the presentation, we would like to begin, as we begin all our meetings, with a We Care moment. Can you advance this slide? We spend a few minutes each day to discuss matters and a foster an environment where people can both work safely and feel safe physically and emotionally, generate ideas and provide better customer service and make a difference in the communities we serve. Just one second, I don't think we're seeing the slides yet. Okay. Bob, could you reshare? Just one second, sorry. So I have some safety tips to discuss with the group today um, regarding spring weather. Uh, spring is in the air and that means warmer weather, blooming flowers, and the potential for extreme weather conditions. So don't let thunderstorms and floods and tornadoes take you by surprise this season. Um, here's some five tips to help you keep safety in mind with this weather. Stay informed, listen to the weather radio. Um, National Oceanic and Atmospheric in, uh, Administration has great radio stations um, to stay informed. When you hear thunder, go indoors. Take it seriously. Lightning strikes can be rare, but they still happen. Don't underestimate the power and force of water in an extreme flood condition. It's never safe to drive or walk into any kind of floodwaters. Be prepared for flying objects, falling debris, and most deaths and injuries during a tornado is what causes that. Um, go into the basement, inside a room without windows, and the lowest floor. So just keep these things in mind. Cover your body with a blanket, sleeping bag, or mattress, and protect your head with anything available. Again, um, prepare for everywhere. It's always a great idea to keep an emergency kit for at home or on the road. Um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Lindsay and Bob to learn a little bit more about New Jersey American Water and your... Next slide. Yeah, I'm having a... Let me just bring this back up again.
Sorry about that. No problem. Okay, the screen is back up, it looks like. Okay. There we go. There we go. Perfect. Okay, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Margie. Um, those are great tips for spring weather. And um, I think, you know, especially if you travel to other places in the um, country, you know, there's different spring weather concerns at different areas. So that was a great reminder. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. Today, I am going to start with an overview of New Jersey American Water State and Coastal North local operations. So on the map, you see two New Jerseys. The New Jersey on the left is color coded. The um, dark blue is counties where we have water and wastewater services. The light blue is counties where we have water service and Bergen County, we have wastewater service. So we serve over 600,000 water service customers and almost 60,000 wastewater service customers throughout the state. The area I'm responsible for, the Coastal North Operations System, is in Monmouth and Ocean Counties. So now if you scoot over to the right um, New Jersey, you'll see Monmouth and Ocean Counties are in Water Supply Critical Area 1. So Critical Area 1, thank you, um, the water withdrawals are much more limited and they're managed and regulated by the New Jersey DEP. So DEP regulates them and manages them so that we could avoid safe yield and saltwater intrusion impacts. So it's very important. The conservation of water in our area is extremely important. Let's go to the next, um, the next slide. It's going to show a graph. Okay. So this graph has green and orange dots all over it in line. So the green dots are our, maxim, our max days, maximum days over the past 15 years. And the orange dots below are our average days over the past 15 years. So we use these numbers, our max day and our average day, when we're designing our treatment facilities, our distribution facilities, to make sure that we have adequate water supplies so we can provide safe, adequate, reliable drinking water to our customers. So if you look at the green line, you could see it kind of shifting up to the right. That means our um, it's indicating an increase in our demand over the past 15 years, our max day demand. So since it's our max day demand, that indicates that it could be a potential increase in demand from irrigation in our service area. So the goal of today's call is to enable you, our large customers and our irrigation contractors in our communities to be water efficient in your irrigation use. Um, that will in turn give us a really great opportunity so that we can enable growth in the area and provide more water service to more to provide water service to more customers in the future. So I hope that gives you a base understanding of why we're here. And then I'm going to turn it over to Bob to um, go through all of the irrigation slides. I'm excited to listen. Thank you, Lindsay. Bob, we just need you to unmute uh, when you're ready. There you go. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, those, if you've uh, recently bought an electrical appliance or whatever, uh, you know, you buy a refrigerator or uh, a microwave, you'll see on that uh, the Energy Star symbol. And this was a program that was started by the Environmental Protection Agency many, many years ago. And uh, back in about 2004, the EPA uh, started to acknowledge that there are an awful lot of variety of devices out there that use water. Uh, and it would be nice to have a program similar to the Energy Star system for those devices that use water. And so that was the birth of the WaterSense program. So the EPA sort of acknowledged that this is something that would take time to implement, and they started to look at, well, where can we have the most immediate impact on the reduction and conservation of water? And what their studies actually found out that uh, when we looked at landscape irrigation, uh, it accounted for about one third of all the residential water use. Uh, and that one third uh, actually is
about 7 million, 7 billion gallons of water per day. Okay. Um, and the EPA study then went for a little bit further and they collected a lot of irrigation audits from around the country. Uh, and in analyzing that, they actually uh, were able to determine that 50% of that 7 billion gallons of water was, was not necessary, that was actually being wasted, that the landscape was not uh, benefiting from it. So the outdoor water use, in particular landscape irrigation, was one of the first focus points of that, that water sense program. But I think it sort of highlights uh, the inefficiencies that exist in many of our irrigation uh, systems and a need for us to try to be able to better monitor those. So there, there are some challenges there. And, uh, you know, one of the things here in New Jersey, we have to realize that it's actually easier for us to schedule irrigation in Scottsdale, Arizona, than it is in Manalapa, New Jersey. So, uh, you know, wh why is that the case? Um, you know, if we're to look at the weather patterns in the Southwest and many other areas of the country, they don't vary uh, very much. They are more consistent from one year to another. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, um, irrigation season of May to October, which would mirror what we do, uh, pick that sort of same time frame. Their average daytime temperature is 84 degrees. The average high temperature is 97 degrees. Um, and the monthly rainfall averages less than one inch, about 0.69 inches. My point is that that, that does not deviate uh, very much from year to year. And yes, there are some years when it's going to be higher or a little bit lower, but it's, it, it's far more consistent. Uh, and, and let's compare that to what we actually have uh, in New Jersey and why, why it presents challenges in our management of our irrigation systems. So uh, these, these uh, weather patterns change the irrigation requirement. And I picked a couple of Augusts uh, from a few years back that I think exemplify this uh, drastic variation in weather patterns that we have. So um, if you were to go and look at the August of 2014, um, you know, we had an average daytime temperature in that August of 71 degrees. That's 2.4 degrees below what is normal. Um, they started taking recording weather records back in 1895. And so that August, it was the 32nd coolest August since records were kept. Um, in, in New Jersey, um, you know, during the month of August, the average rainfall is about 4.2 inches. Well, in August of 2014, uh, we had 6.6 .6 inches. So we had almost two and a half inches above what the average rainfall was. Truth of the matter is probably uh, there wasn't a day in August or very few of them that irrigation was required at all. So if we fast forward um, a couple of years, and, and, and let's look at the August of 2016, uh, Margaret and I were involved in a little research project with the uh, American Water Company, and, and we can really document that that was a pretty stressful August period. You know, we had average daytime high temperatures at 88 degrees. Uh, second hottest August on record since uh, 1895. Uh, the total accumulated rainfall for the month of August was only 0.4 inches, so we're 3.8 inches below uh, normal. So if we look at that, I think it uh, you know really exemplifies the variations in weather patterns that we have and the dramatic variations. Uh, that we need to make uh, an adjustments to our irrigation systems uh, to accommodate those uh, drastic uh, variations in weather pattern. So what, what I'd like to start the uh, discussion on on this is, uh, you know, how do we develop and impl implement an irrigation schedule that can water efficiently uh, during these periods of time? And I want to take a rather unique look at uh, you know what happens with with irrigation, 
And uh, I, this is actually from an education session I attended, uh, you know, way back, probably about 25 or 30 years ago, um, put on by the USGA. And I thought it was a unique way of looking at what happens with um, a sprinkler system or a sprinkler. So the question was asked, uh, you know, when the water leaves the sprinkler head, what, what can actually happen to it? Okay. So there are several things that, that can occur with that water as it's uh, dispensed from the sprinkler head. Uh, number one, if we're irrigating in the middle of the day when it's warm out and sunny out and such, um, there's, you know, 10, 15% of that water that may evaporate before it even hits the uh, turf surface or the plant surface. Okay. Uh, if we've got a fair amount of water uh, that's already been accumulated, uh, we continue to irrigate, irrigate uh, you know, that water is going to puddle. Uh, you know, so it's either irrigation that's applied above the soil's infiltration rate or when the soil is already already saturated. Uh, the next option is it can overspray the intended target area. So this is something that uh, I think we see all too much of um, during the summer months if we're riding around and looking at irrigation systems running in Monmouth County and throughout uh, the state of New Jersey. You know, we've got a four foot wide strip of turf there that's trying to be irrigated and we've got a sprinkler nozzle there that's throwing 12 feet. So a uh, vast majority of that irrigation water, that water that's being dispersed by the sprinkler head, isn't even landing on the intended target. Uh, we, if we continue to um, irrigate uh, at lengthy periods of time, uh, it can actually run off the intended target. Um, th this is a picture I happened to take a number of years back when I was in Washington, D.C., and it was actually the White House lawn. Uh, so the, the, the next, um, next possibility is that that water from the sprinkler head uh, is landing on the plant surface, um, and it's percolating down into the plant root zone. Um, and then finally, um, if that plant root zone is full and we continue to irrigate, uh, it can irrigate through the plant root zone uh, down below where the root structure is. And this is referred to as a deep percolation. So I, I thought it was a unique way of looking at what happened to our um, water that's being dispersed by our uh, sprinkler heads. Uh, our irrigation system. And, and when we look at all of those, um, you know, uh, which of these, or are there multiple ones of these that are really uh, beneficial to the landscape, beneficial to the turf, beneficial to the plant area? And when we, when we look at these, it's really only the infiltration into the plant root zone uh, that is really beneficial to the plant. So as we look at efficient irrigation and how we're going to operate our irrigation systems, our goal really is to get the, the um, largest percentage, uh, the highest percentage of the water that's going into our irrigation system, that's going through the water meter, to get as much of that as possible into the plant root zone. And the more of that water that actually gets into the plant root zone, uh, the more efficient the irrigation system is. Um, and that really should be our, our goal is to, um, to operate the system efficiently. So most of the water that we're looking at actually uh, gets down where it's beneficial to the plant. So there's something we should realize. Um, it's really difficult, if not impossible, to develop an efficient irrigation system for a poorly designed uh, and installed irrigation system. So this is actually in Homedale, New Jersey, um, and you can see there's two uh, residences uh, right across from one another here. Um, this one has an irrigation system that was um, well designed, sprinkler heads spaced properly, uh, water that's not overthrowing on the unintended area uh, that is managed properly. 
Um, and you can see by the turf color that, uh, you know, this is a stressful uh, period of the summer, uh, but the turf is in really pretty decent shape. Uh, on the opposite side of the street, we have a pretty poorly designed irrigation system. Um, and uh, you, you can see it's under irrigating uh, quite substantially. There are some spots where we have some green areas and we have some spots where we have some totally dead grass. So um, my point here is that it's, uh, programming is not really going to uh, you know, benefit this. Uh, uh, the unfortunate solution for the homeowner is to drastically over irrigate this area uh, in the hope that we're going to get these brown spots to disappear. Um, the system in pro had been properly designed, uh, that would not be necessary. So this is just sort of a, a look at um, the, the penetration of the irrigation water down into the plant root zone and what we would consider uh, high uniformity or system and one that we have low uniformity. So we could just sort of picture that we have a sprinkler head in each corner, and this is the pattern that they're throwing in. Um, and ideally, yes, we'd like to have this to be a perfect straight line here. You know, our technology hasn't quite gotten there yet. But I think we'd all agree that this is preferential to what we have over here. So, you know, we get into July and August in a situation like this, and we, we have a period we don't have any rain. Uh, you know, what's going to happen here? We're going to end up with... Uh, these areas browning out, um, not getting sufficient water. And, you know, so what's the remedy to it? Well, the uh, client or the contractor or whoever's managing this irrigation system, they go in and they start to tweak the runtime and increase it to make this area in here get sufficient water. Um, so the brown spot disappears. And in doing so, what are we doing? All the rest of the areas here uh, are getting, you know, dramatically more water than is what is uh, necessary to maintain a healthy landscape. And, and this, in essence, is what the um, EPA discovered with the studies that they were doing uh, in initiating the water sense program. Um, so, uh, you know, I. I my company actually started back in 1968, so we're, we're, you know, 54 years old right now. And, you know, back then, sort of the philosophy of systems were, uh, you know, we're just going to go in there, we're going to put a program in a controller, and we're done. You might remember this gentleman, Ron Propeal, in the commercials he used to do on TV, you know, just set it and forget it. And unfortunately, um, really until fairly recently, this has sort of been the theory that we've had with automatic irrigation systems. You know, I know um, some contractors that when they turn the system on in you know, April or early May, they don't want to be bothered by their clients. So they set a program in there that's going to be sufficient irrigation for the you know, peak warm months of the year. So grossly over irrigating. So th this is a um, philosophy or technology or a, a way of trying to control irrigation that we really, really need to get away from. And, you know, I, I used to tell our clients very often, you know, if you had to go in and make an adjustment to your thermostat at home, you had to turn the air conditioning up and such. Um, you know, that uh, probably you should go over to your irrigation controller and make some sort of adjustments there. Uh, reality, what typically happens, it gets warm out, gets kind of hot. If the um, residential client sees the lawn turning brown, they go in and increase the runtime on the controller to make, um, make the brown spots disappear. And then when it cools off, they forget to go back and, and, and make the adjustments. So the point is frequent and act, accurate schedule adjustments they create programs that maintain a healthy landscape, but they're able to do so on a minimal amount of irrigation. And, and that, that should be uh, really one of our uh, goals in, in looking at using water efficiently. So uh, how much water do we need? And uh, how much water does the landscape require? 
So um, you might remember this guy. Um, well, it's not really uh, this uh, movie character, um, but it is ET, which is evapotranspiration. And evapotranspiration is really a combination of water that's transpired from the vegetation, so it can actually be on the leaf surface, or it's evaporated from the soil and the plant surface. Um, obviously, the warmer it gets out, um, you know, the, the higher the ET rate. So it directly impacts on how quickly this water that's stored in the plant itself and in the soil, uh, how quickly that, that can be depleted. Um, and it's... Um, And is directly uh, has a direct impact on that on the health of our uh, our turf and landscape. So let, let's take a quick look at uh, what really impacts um, ET. So if we take a look at this little diagram, if we if we look on this side of the diagram, we can see that it's cloudy out. There's no breeze blowing. Uh, temperature is uh, relatively lower. Uh, we have a high humidity situation. So everything on this side over here is going to reduce the evapotranspiration. When we get over on this side, we take a look at it. We've got full sun. There's not a cloud in the sky. We've got high temperatures. Uh, we've got a nice breeze that's blowing. And we have very, very low humidity. Uh, so we're going to have a dramatic, you know, it's these, both of these can be on July 15th. In one case, we're going to have low ET. On the other case, we're going to have high ET. Um, that August that we looked at back in 2016, that, that is really what we had over here. And what made that August so especially stressful for uh, the landscape and increased the irrigation need. Uh, you know, typically, the months of August in New Jersey are extremely humid. And for whatever reason, our humidity that August was, uh, you know, much more moderate than we would normally experience. And this dramatically increased the evapotranspiration rate. And in doing so, increased the uh, irrigation requirement. So we, we used to have very little uh, accesses to, to looking at what daily ET is. Um, this site here, I believe it's not up and running yet, but when you get into the summer months, this is a site that's maintained by the uh, state uh, weather uh, department at Rutgers University. And this is one of the manufacturers, but you can actually go into these sites and actually you know, be able to uh, look at what the evapotranspiration uh, rate are. There's also another one that's put out by Cornell University. So, so what, what are we really looking to try to do? If we efficiently manage irrigation, uh, what we want to do, uh, this is the plant root zone. And when it is filled with the maximum amount of water it can hold, it's, um, it's at what they call field capacity. Um, and then as it starts to dry out, it will eventually reach what they call the permanent wilting point. And the difference between field capacity and permanent wilting point is what water is available to the plant material. So um, you can see on this turf it, uh, that it's really entering a very stressful period of time. Um, and that if it doesn't get some irrigation on it, it's going to go dormant uh, and uh, you know turn brown. So really what, what our goal here should be, is this plant available water is basically the plant's uh, gas tank. And we should approach this the uh, same way that we approach filling up our car with gas. You know, we, we, we shouldn't be waiting till we get all the way down dead on empty before we fill it up. So likewise, with the uh, plant root zone, when we have a certain percentage of that moisture that's been used up or depleted, uh, we want to fill it back up again to capacity um, before the plant actually gets, gets stressed. So, so that's, in a nutshell, um, sort of the 
theory that that we use on how much irrigation water we need to uh, we need to apply. So before we look at this a little bit further, um, I want to clear up what I think are a few uh, misconceptions. Um, and you know, I've worked with uh, the folks at Rutgers and and uh, um, you know the uh, Division of Water Resources and some of their drought recommendations and such. Um, and there's a misconception that, that uh, is portrayed. I just recently looked at the um, EPA website on drought monitoring, and uh, they also are, um, um, you know, touting that this is one of the things that we look should look at doing. They basically say that lawns in New Jersey require one inch of water per week. Well, that, that is a really misleading statement. And if we were to go back and look at the historical data, um, this is 30-year data uh, of evapotranspiration rates in the central part of New Jersey. And if we were to look here, and you know, maybe we're starting up here in a, another few weeks with our irrigation, and we look at the ET rates about 0.57, uh, May is 0.96. We get into June, July, which is the most stressful period generally in, in New Jersey. Uh, and then August, September, and October. Uh, well, you know what? Uh, other than these 0.296s, there's none of these ET rates that are, you know, close on to being one inch of water per week. So yes, um, th th these um, average out to be about one inch per week. But uh, the truth of the matter is, if in April or October we're putting out an inch of water per week, we're wasting a heck of a lot of water. And as we get into June, July, and August, uh, you know, particularly if it's dry with no supplemental rainfall, that one inch per week is probably going to be inadequate to maintain healthy turf and a healthy landscape. So um, it, it, it can be used as an overall benchmark but it really shouldn't be guiding us, um, you know, month by month as the ET rates are uh, dramatically different. So the next um, concept that we have, and again, this is on uh, the, uh, the DEP website, water infrequently and deep to encourage deep rooting. So um, there, there's a lot of validity to that. But to, to really understand uh, what's happening is, you know, let's just take a look at this slide here, which is showing us both the shoot growth and the root growth of cool season turf grass. Now, this is something if you are in a have a landscape company that mows lawn, you know, as you get into uh, end of April, early May and everything like that, you mow the lawn and three days later, it looks like uh, there's so much shoot growth on it. It looks like it's never, ever been mowed. So, uh, you know, there's rapid shoot growth at that. Uh, even with irrigation systems, if we are effectively irrigating, as we get into the months of July and August, the shoot growth is going to calm down. It's not going to grow at the same rate. Uh, you know, any of you that are involved in, you know, lawn maintenance and such certainly know that even systems with irrigation systems, when you get into July and August, you're not mowing as frequently because the turf doesn't grow as rapidly. Well, if we look on the underside of this down into the plant root zone, and, and that is similarly um, impacted by these temperatures. So right around now, we have about the deepest plant root growth that we, have, that we have. But as we get into those stressful months, even with irrigation, the root zone is going to shrink. It's going to draw up a little bit. So, um, you know, think about this. If we're trying to water deep over here, we're probably okay because we're still in the plant root zone. Uh, we get into July and August, these very stressful periods of time. Once we have filled this plant root zone up and we're still watering because we're told to water deep, you know, it's going down in here <clears throat> below the uh, plant's root zone where it's not beneficial to the plant material. 
Ladies and gentlemen, there are a misconception, too, that the roots will chase the water. Well, they're going to grow a little bit down in that direction, but there's not going to be any dynamic, uh, quick root growth chasing the water. So again, as the temperatures start to cool, the root zone gets deeper, we get more shoot growth. So, um, you know, just uh, trying to water once a week deeply in July and August, uh, you're not really benefiting the plant material. And what you're really doing is, is wasting quite a bit of water. So, um, you know, we probably need three, maybe four applications, lighter applications of water uh, so that the water we're applying is staying in the plant root zone. <clears throat> Here's another misconception we have. The plant is dying. It needs more water. Uh, you know, you talk to a lot of the uh, landscape uh, companies in New Jersey that do substantial plantings and such. And many of them will tell you that they lose more plant material due to overwatering than they do to underwatering. The case with this particular slide, uh, taxes used which don't tolerate wet feet. You can see that the turf area here is um, pretty lush, uh, but the plants that don't tolerate excessive moisture uh, have died from the overwatering. So. Uh, it's it's a concern, you know, why is the plant not healthy? And uh, too frequently, it's blamed on lack of water. Um, rain sensors don't work. And I think many of you are probably aware, here in New Jersey, there is a state law that every new system has to have a rain sensor. Um, so um, currently there's a bill pending that would also require updates if you sell a house as a condition of a certificate of occupancy. If it doesn't have a rain sensor, one would need to be added. So this perception that rain sensors don't work, we should look a little bit at them like we do a smoke detector. And you know, a rain sensor, first of all, it needs to be properly installed, should be checked and tested. Uh, if it's battery operated, you know, the battery needs to be replaced per the uh, manufacturer's recommendation. Uh, a number of years back, I had the pleasure of working with Michelle Putnam, who was uh, the director of the Division of Water Supply in the DEP. Uh, and she was asked, you know, uh, I mean, what would you do to, you know, try to improve irrigation? And this is her verbatim quote. If I could have one irrigation regulation, it would require every irrigation in the state, every irrigation system in the state to be equipped with a rain sensor. And the sensor would have to be tested once a year. So she had a realization that these were very often installed and then never really checked out. So she knew that they worked. And it's is really something that, that uh, you know, the contractor base in the state should be able to implement. So uh, let's look at what happened last year, okay? Uh, let's look at the precipitation in the Northeast and in particular in New Jersey and in Monmouth and Ocean counties. So um, th this information is a sort of the rainfall. Um, and you can see we're in May of 2022. Um, New Jersey is really in pretty good shape. Our average rainfall is around four inches. Um, you know, most of the state is a little above that down in the southern part here. We're right around four inches. You know, things are really pretty good. Um, we, we move into June. Um, we're still not in too bad a shape. The area down in South Jersey, down in Cape May, Salem County's down here. It's a little bit stressed out here. Um, we typically have about 4.23 inches here. We're between three and four inches, so we're a little, little light. Uh, now we move into uh, July, and my goodness, take a look at July. When we go into July here, we look at Monmouth County here, and, and we are, you know, less than two inches of rain when we normally have four and a half inches of rain. So we're already in, in a stressful period of time. Um, we uh, get into... Uh, August. Um, also, now we have much more of the state, um, you know, under three inches of rainfall. Uh, Monmouth County, we got a little area here, we're getting a little bit more, but still very, very stressful period of time. 
And when we get into September, uh, most of the state is moderating, but we look at Monmouth and Ocean counties down here, we're still not out of the woods yet. We're still uh, a little bit below what our normal rainfall would be. And then as we've got into October, you can see we've uh, recovered. We now have ample rainfall. So this is uh, you know, re really, really uh, became a, a stressful period during the middle of the summer. So when we look at uh, New Jersey, when we look at uh, the D DEP has uh, divided New Jersey into uh, the state into six uh, drought regions. And almost all of Monmouth County um, is in this particular region here, which is the uh, coastal north region. A little bit out by uh, Allentown out here is in another one. But for the most part, you know, 95% of the state is in this uh, north, uh, coastal north region. So um, the Division of Water Supply and Geoscience, which is in the DEP, they regularly monitor uh, the various water supply conditions uh, in each one of these. Uh, and they are uh, the, the agency that will initiate some sort of drought restriction. So if we look, look at last summer, um, you know, these are the different drought statuses that we can have. Uh, normal status, which we're at now, a watch, um, which just voluntary reduction is asked, a warning, and then finally uh, an emergency. And where our industry, the irrigation industry, has been in, impacted a little bit by water restrictions, uh, very often they are colloquial or localized. Uh, the last time we really had a watch or warning was back in 2016, that August that we refer to that was so drastically dry and hot. Um, and the first time, last time we really had uh, mandatory water restrictions was back in 2002. So, um, you know, we've been pretty lucky. But you know what? We, we came pretty darn close in 2022 to, to having some of these actions uh, implemented by the uh, DEP. Um, so this was uh, a, uh, a news release back in August 10th. It says a large portion of central Jersey, including parts of all Monmouth, Middlesex, Union, Somerset, Hunterton, and Mercer County were experiencing a moderate drought. Uh, th this further takes it a little bit more, um, and we can actually look at the drought status, and here we are in Monmouth County, and you can see July, we're abnormally dry. Um, in August, by August, we're in moderate drought, uh, or early August. The end of August, we have, especially the coastal regions in Monmouth County here, we're, we're in a severe drought situation. So we, we just sort of lucked out that we didn't have more uh, stringent restrictions um, due, to, uh, due to the drought. So um, it, you have to realize that uh, New Jersey American Water is our partner in this situation. Uh, they have a water supply uh, plan uh, based on historic demand and such. And, and that plan uh, includes water for irrigation. Um, and their revenue, the, the uh, income that they make, uh, you know, that irrigation water uh, during the summer months is an important part of the uh, income that they receive. And, you know, and they're a publicly, publicly held corporation with investors that expect dividends. So the, the water company is very proactive in, in you know, looking to be able to supply uh, the water that's needed for the, for the landscape. So in reality, you know, we're more like partners in this. We are not adversaries and we should be working together um, to be able to, to, to supply um, the water that's needed to keep our landscapes healthy. But you, you do need to realize that, that um, you know, there are responsibilities, not only for New Jersey American Water Company, but for any, any water company uh, that has to take precedence. Um, and their first responsibility is really to provide safe, adequate, reliable drinking water uh, to their clients, to their customers. Um, and uh, 
the, the next major responsibility, which becomes challenging at times, um, they need to maintain a certain amount of water pressure in the distribution main lines uh, in order to be able to fight fires. And this was a fire, it was actually at, not in New Jersey American Waters District, uh, but it actually was a fire that probably could have been uh, uh, much less damage done to it, but uh, they had problems with the water pressure in the water mains, and therefore the fire departments had to get water from much further away, and uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, the house was pretty much destroyed in that period of time. So uh, in the irrigation industry, we, we need to understand that the water company's first responsibility is the potable water supply and supplying sufficient pressure to start um, to uh, do firefighting. Uh, yes, and then to help us maintain um, healthy, attractive uh, landscapes. So let, let's look at um, where we are here. You know, we're the last day in, in March. Uh, and let's take a look and see what irrigation contractors can do uh, working in conjunction with the water company to uh, ensure there's an adequate water supply for the upcoming landscape and irrigation season. And, you know, we can do all the planning in the world. It's Mother Nature that's really going to tell whether or not we are totally successful. But there are some things that we can do to help. So um, you very often hear when there's some initiation of some sort of drought restriction to do even odd watering. Well, there probably is no reason why we can't look at just having even odd watering all the time. Um, and so even numbers would water on, even number addresses water on even days, odd numbers on odd days. Um, if you look at the regulations that usually get implemented, they don't want somebody to be uh, rewarded because they happen to have an odd number day and it's the 31st of the month. So they generally say, OK, let's not irrigate on the 31st day of the month. Um, and when we do so, we, we should do so by implementing run times. Uh, that are appropriate for these schedules. Unfortunately, so many times when even odd watering is implemented, uh, the contractor or the homeowner, whoever's managing the irrigation system, they run over there and the first thing they do is increase the run time on all the different stations to, to accommodate for the fact that you're, ever, you're only watering every other day. So the goal here is to do so, but not arbitrarily increase the run times because we're going to odd even watering, okay? Uh, th this is interesting because the first education, uh, when I got into the industry, I went to a two week technical school down in Texas and this was in 1968. Um, and you know, a lot of lit the literatures and books and such that were um, uh, authored back then, uh, you know, their philosophy on when you should irrigate, it was lawn sprinkler systems should be programmed to start watering in the early morning hours when water demand is at its lowest and the, when the water pressures are highest. So that was fine in 1968. But, you know, we should realize in 1968, um, lawn sprinkler systems or irrigation systems were pretty much a luxury. Uh, today, if you go into uh, you know most uh, most areas, a vast majority of the homes will have an automatic irrigation system. So now we fast forward to 2023, and we look at the summer months, and you know New Jersey uh, American water uh, that's their peak demand period in the early morning hours. All right, and uh, these peak demands uh, very often impact. Uh, the available water pressure in the system. So um, it, it becomes a, a, a real challenging uh, uh, condition. Uh, I've been in one of the filtration plants talking to the operators and they say, boy, it's just amazing when we get in early morning hours, you know, they have a meter there that shows what the flow output into the distribution system is. And boy, we start getting up here around two o'clock in the morning, it increases and increases and increases. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is this is midnight here, uh, going over to the following midnight, and these are the demands on the distribution system of American Water. And as you can see in here, um, we're right up here. We get at four or five o'clock in the morning. This is where the peak demand 
on their distribution system is. And why is that? It's because the majority of the irrigation systems are running at that period of time. And you can look at this, the demand is twice what it is throughout the rest of the day. Back in 68, the demand period used to be like from six to seven o'clock at night when the husband came home from work and was taking a shower and the uh, dinner was being prepared. Uh, but now these demands are twice what they are during the rest of the um, rest of the 24 hour period. So, uh, you know, a majority irrigation system start in those early morning hours. Um, and it really puts a strain on on being able to replenish the water in that distribution system, um, particularly when we get in very peak periods of time, storage levels and those tanks drop down to dangerously low levels that um, you know really become a challenge for fire departments if they need to uh, uh, you know fight fire at the early morning hours. So um, you know ho hopefully there's a little something that we can do. Um, you know, committing to those even odd watering schedules are going to help a little bit. Uh, now, there's a possibility that we can vary start times. Now, when you look at when you normally start irrigation, you don't like to have the turf grass going into the evening hours uh, damp because it helps to promote uh, fungal fungus growth. Um, but, you know, maybe some ch chances that we can start it at 10 o'clock at night rather than 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, also, um, if we have smaller systems, you know, maybe we can go ahead and we can start them at uh, five or six o'clock in the morning if they're only going to run for a couple of hours. Uh, and and uh, this is not going to have a dramatic impact, but hopefully maybe it can have a, a, at least some sort of impact on this water schedule here. Maybe uh, the goal would be to sort of uh, spread it out a little bit so that the uh, these high peaks aren't here. Um, so, um, you know, it, it's an uh, exercise that would be worthwhile trying. Um, if you talk to uh, uh, New Jersey, American, you talk to other water companies and you ask for what's your really peak period. And uh, most of the time it comes down to the same weekend every single year, uh, particularly if the weather is warm. Um, and, and that is the uh, 4th of July period. Uh, you know, there were, have been many years where there's a crisis call that's put out by uh, New Jersey American and other water companies just begging people, you know, stop filling your pools, stop washing your cars, please turn your sprinkler systems off. And why is that? Uh, because there is dangerously low water pressure. We were working at a facility, a, 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 actually a golf club, where the clubhouse was at a very, very high elevation. We happened to be there on, on July 3rd, um, and the faucets on the second floor of the clubhouse, you would open it and no water would come out. The pressure was so low. So these are dangerous situations. So, um, you know, encouraging, um, if you're controlling an irrigation system operation, so maybe you just skip irrigating on the 4th of July, uh, make up for it on the, on, on the following day or so. So, um, you know, stressful periods that hopefully we could be part, at least a small part, part of a solution. Uh, and again, making sure that uh, every system has a rain sensor that works, uh, very important that it's in the right location. Uh, I have a collection of pictures I've taken over the course of the years of rain sensors in the most ridiculous locations and just are never, ever going to be hit by rain. So there should be in a location where it's going to be exposed to rain from all different directions. If they're not, looking to move them would, would be beneficial. Uh, looking also to you know, make sure that the batteries are in good supply, that they're, they're, they're healthy and they're going to get through the irrigation season. And then also there's you know, newer versions of, uh, of rain sensors. The typical rain sensor waits for a quarter inch of rain to fall and then it, it interrupts the system. So some of the newer ones will interrupt the system much, much quicker. So, um, you know, possibly updating some of the rain sensors to these new um, quick sensor or programmable rain sensors. Um, this is what many of you will be doing shortly. This is sort of just like a checklist uh, running through the system, making sure that the piping system's in good condition, 
uh, checking the heads to make sure they're operating properly. Uh, here, here, here's an interesting point. Uh, you know, I've been involved um, with uh, one of the manufacturers in doing uh, audits of irrigation systems where some of the sprinkler heads were tilted like over here. So when we look at here, on this side, the spray is going up at the proper angle. Over here, this one's going way up in the air, and this one's hardly getting off the ground. And if you were to do an irrigation audit, which measures the efficiency of this system, you will find that the one with the tilted sprinkler heads is going to have far poor uniformity um, than the one with the good, uh, with the head set right. So a, a simple thing like straightening sprinkler heads up can improve the uniformity, okay? Um, you know, make sure they're operating at the correct pressure, uh, appropriate nozzles, uh, make sure they're not overthrowing on paved or unwanted areas, okay? Uh, smart controllers have become a lot more popular over the last 10 or 12 years. So upgrading to a smart controller can also... Um, help. Now, today, smart controllers can carry the EPA water sense uh, seal of approval. So you can actually go on the EPA website and look in, at uh, the controllers that have gone through this extensive uh, testing. I'm going to take a quick minute here to look at these rain sensors and or these smart uh, controllers rather. And, and they primarily work on, on three different premises. And we're just going to quickly look at the three ways that they will adjust the irrigation program. So uh, the one way is they make automatic adjustments um, to the uh, program that's in the controller based on what the daily ET rate is. So this can be by an on-site sensor. It can be uh, brought in, uh, you know, via a, a service. Uh, my point here is that in order for this to be beneficial, the accurate base program that's in that controller has to, has to be proper. It can't be over irrigating or under irrigating. So th this, um, this is one of the simpler ones. Uh, it's telling me that right now it's, a, it's irrigating to 80% of what the program that was in there. So um, that it um, again will, will only be beneficial. We have a good base program in there. Um, I say we put garbage in, you get garbage out. Uh, second one um, requires the uh, information about every one of the zones. It requires the soil type, the plant irrigation information, how quickly the irrigation system supplying water, and then the actual controller builds a program. Uh, and it adjusts that program every single day by what the evapotranspiration is. Is. So we need to put the plant type, the soil type, the root depth, the exposure, the slope, the microclimate, whether it's sunny or shady, uh, water window, when we can irrigate it, the sprinkler type, and how fast the sprinkler applies water, um, and, in, and what the efficiency of the system is. So um, then that controller is going to um, develop the runtime for every one of the zones. So it's based on the information that you put in. And again, if you put invalid in, you're going to get bad outcomes of it. So. And then the last way is really looking to, uh, if we look at any of these things here, they're sort of trying to guess what the soil moisture level is, all right? So the other method of doing it is, well, let's measure that soil moisture level. And we got a program in there. And if there's sufficient moisture in there for the plant material, well, we're just not going to irrigate those areas. So they're, they're uh, really sort of thought of like being uh, rain sensors are buried in the soil. When there's sufficient moisture there, they're not going to run. So uh, again, there's some important things here. Um, they need to be installed in the plant root zone. All right, that's where we want to measure the moisture. Uh, they need to be hit by the irrigation system because when the irrigation system puts the water on there, it's going to add moisture and the sensor needs to be able to record that. Um, if we have uh, a large landscape and such, we have plants with different water requirements. We have area that's sandy and an area that's he heavy clay soil. Uh, we have an area that's exposed to full sun and an area that's really shady. 
So all of those would really should have their own independent moisture sensor uh, to be measuring the, the moisture content in there. All right. Um, and we really want to put that sensor in the area of that uh, you know, particular plant type or whatever uh, that's going to dry out first. If there happens to be a little low area, it's going to stay wet. We don't want the sensor there. So we want it where it's, it's going to dry out first. So um, here's a couple of uh, reports that have come off. Uh, this is an ET-based controller. And if we look at this, this is the evapotranspiration rate. This is the adjustments that were made to the irrigation program. And you can see they, they pretty much mirror what the evapotranspiration rate was. Um, now, let, let's take a look and say that we had a controller that was set to run 30 minutes per station every day. That's where that would have irrigated. And it's, we can see very much that it would have applied uh, substantially more water than the smart controller did. So here's one that has um, moisture sensors. And when the moisture drops down to the threshold, it turns the irrigation on and it, 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 it refills. So here are those low levels. Um, this is what would have happened if we were irrigating on a regular basis three times a week. And again, I think it clearly, clearly shows that this would have used a lot more water. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I, I do want to point out that when we get into that stressful month of August 2016, um, all of these technologies are saying, boy, it is really hot and dry out and we need more irrigation water. So when you get into the very stressful periods of time, yes, they're going to do what they're supposed to do. And they're going to, um, you know, irrigate more frequently. Um, and in some cases, you know, apply more water than what a typical, typical program would, uh, would require. So these require a higher um, degree of knowledge, uh, understanding a soil water plant relationship a uh, basic knowledge of uh, different plant materials, what requires a lot of water, what will not tolerate very much water, uh, the ability to know or calculate how fast your water from your irrigation system is being applied to the turf and landscape. Um, and again, if we input bad information in there, it's going to generate unsuitable outcome, garbage in, garbage out. And that's really what we want to try to avoid. Uh, there's many classes given uh, at Rutgers and the Irrigation Association of New Jersey. Uh, also online classes that can uh, help supplement your, your education in these particular areas. So, um, so uh, let's look uh, for a minute here about irrigating without um, smart controllers. So, you know, smart controllers have only been around for really maybe about 15 years. So we should still be able to improve the way that we're operating our systems without a smart controller. So they be, can be initiated by the contractor or initiated uh, you know, through site visits. Uh, today, we have a lot of uh, technology that allows us to remotely access the controllers and such. So we can perhaps make those changes uh, without having to go to the site. Um, the next one would be consumer initiated. Um, and the easiest way for them to make these changes rather than turning a bunch of dials on, you know, 15 or 12 zones, making maybe a season adjust to irrigating at 50% of the program uh, rather than 100% of the program, uh, getting them accustomed to that feature and, and being willing to do that. Um, you know, it can, you can encourage them to do that, uh, emails, postcards, um, you know, irrigating from historical ET data. So this is where uh, you basically would set a base program in there um, and then it would be adjusted. So right now we have this set at 100%. We could dial it down to 80%. If it happens to be pretty darn hot out, we could go to 120%. So the theory here is to have a relevantly accurate thought out program in the controller 
Um, and then rather than having a client adjusting a bunch of dials, just dialing the uh, season adjust either up or down, depending on what the uh, weather conditions were. So uh, one of the ways that you can do this, we just said we don't want one inch of water per week, but we can actually benefit from that if we were to develop a program in an area that's going to apply one inch of water for each one of our sprinkler zones, okay? And now what we look at is we adjust, um, we're going to take that, we're going to adjust it and tweak it for shady areas, uh, sunny areas, you know, uh, but we get those run times in there tuned as, as best we can for one inch of water per week. Uh, and then we use the water budget or season adjust on the controller. And you'll look, uh, the, these numbers here will mirror a little bit what we looked at when we looked at those ZT rates. So we got that program and, you know, maybe in a lot of part of April, where it's only running at 50%. You know, May, it's going to be a little bit warmer. We're at 100%. If we remember back those first slides, we we're right around one inch of water in, in June. So we're running at 100%. July is going to be our hottest month. We go to 125. But the point is that we're getting multiple adjustments to the to the program. So uh, so that will uh, you know utilize that uh, to uh, to allow that adjustment to be made. Um, I have a couple of contractor friends this is, that uh, swear by this. Uh, you know they have uh, some systems in turf areas that had heavy clay. Um, and so most of our modern controllers have what they call a cycle and soak feature. Um, and so what they actually did was, um, you know, the system would run for 10 minutes. It, it, it's supposed to run for 20 minutes. It runs for 10 minutes. Okay. It stops running. Uh, it soaks for five minutes and then it, then it comes back on again. Uh, so one gentleman that has, oh, you know, literally thousands of residential irrigation systems in has made the determination that all his irrigation systems run on cyclone soak feature. Uh, and he says it's really, really made a difference. And I, I thought it novel and I thought that this was a good venue for maybe uh, maybe presenting it. And, and perhaps some of you would like to try that and see if it makes an appreciable difference in the um you know, in, in getting more of that irrigation water down into the soil profile. I'm going to finish up here on, on just a just a couple of slides that um, you know really are something that um, I, I've been you know usually typically uh, upset about. Um, as you can see, I took a picture of this one. This isn't very far from my office, and uh, we have a tendency with most irrigation contractors with our curb strips here that the way we irrigate the curb strips is we put rotary heads out along the curb and they overthrow the curb onto the uh, lawn area on here. You know, meanwhile, I mean, this is hundreds of feet that is uh, four feet wide that we're irrigating concrete um, and wasting a substantial amount of water. As you can see, it's running down here and running down the curb here. So, uh, I, you know, I, I had a client a number of years ago. It was a very extensive landscape job. It, you know, he'd spent, I want to say probably $175,000, $200,000 landscaping um, his brand new home. It was pretty spectacular. Um, the irrigation system was also a fair amount of money, and it was we designed it real well. But he said, why, do, why are you watering this stuff separately? Just throw across the sidewalk. We don't need little strip heads in along here and i was trying to find a way to uh, encourage him that, that that was a waste of water and so i actually calculated how much money was uh, being wasted by him irrigating that and uh, it really came to a few dollars a month about six or seven dollars a month and I'm thinking, well, if I just spent $175,000 a month on a landscape thing, I don't know if saving six or seven dollars is going to really motivate me. And I calculated the gallons and, yeah, there were some gallons there, but but uh, wasn't sure that that would motivate him even. But then I sort of converted those gallons. And so th this is what I told the client. I said, the water wasted each week during the summer months with you overthrowing that sidewalk. 
you could take that water and your family, it was he and his wife and three children. I said, you could take a shower every single day of the week for the water that you're wasting throwing on the sidewalk. And his reply to that was, oh, my God, you know, uh, all right, let's put those little strip heads in. So my, my goal here is to sort of encourage uh, contractors out there with new systems to, um, yes, it's going to cost a little money. And yes, you're in a competitive situation. Um, but maybe you can use my little discussion about you'll be able to shower every day with the water that you're going to save by not overthrowing that sidewalk. Um, now, there's some towns in New Jersey that have ordinances uh, against doing such. Uh, so, um, you know, it should be something that would should be initiated by the contractor base and not by some regulation put up by the town. So um, let's wrap up here with, uh, you know, how important is irrigation schedule? Uh, well, there are many areas of the country now, particularly with larger systems, that there's uh, companies that do nothing but really, really manage the uh, irrigation system. Uh, they don't install them. They don't service them. Um, what they basically come in is uh, on a regular basis uh, and make sure that the irrigation system is, is applying the appropriate amount of water. As we go through, it's inevitable that we are going to have more water shortages and there'll be more regulations um, coming in place. And the better management we have of our irrigation system, the better prepared we will be uh, to deal with those. Um, you know, we have to get away from Ron Papel's set it and forget it um, philosophy. You know, that's no longer viable. And really what we have is we have efficient irrigation scheduling. It's really the responsible way for us to irrigate and it will result in lower water usage. And ladies and gentlemen, we talk about applying the appropriate amount of water to the landscape. It also generates an, a, a healthier landscape. There's very few plant material that actually benefit from overwatering. So uh, I hope all of that is, is some motivation to, to look at uh, you know, how you're going to manage your client's irrigation systems uh, th this uh, this upcoming season. And uh, Margaret, if we have any uh, questions or thoughts or whatever, we'd certainly like to uh, uh, entertain them. Thank you, Bob. And thank you, Lindsay. That was wonderful. Really appreciate all that great information about um, irrigation and irrigation efficiency. Um, we did get one question and I'll just uh, chime in and encourage folks, if you have any additional questions, please um, speak up. Um, Greg posted a question in regard to understanding that this idea for the future, uh, this being an idea for the future will require a tremendous amount of planning and coordination. Will the water supply ever be segregated into potable and non-potable using treated, F, treated sewer effluent for irrigation and firefighting and possibly for recharge? That, that, that is an awesome question. And, uh, you know, in many other areas of the country, uh, th there are dual water mains. Um, there, uh, the modern sewer plants at the time that they were put in, there were effluent distribution systems um, put in to uh, disseminate that to large planned residential communities and even even to the homeowners. Uh, you know, it'd be nice to see that happen in New Jersey. It's obviously a huge investment in infrastructure to to uh, put put water mains in. Uh, interesting enough, a couple of years uh, back, the town of Cary, North Carolina. Um, that's down in the research triangle down there. And they knew that they were poised for immense growth. Uh, and they had to put a new sewer plant in. And so when they did, uh, they made provisions for taking that effluent water, highly treated effluent water, and put part of the plan was a distribution system that went through these areas that were, were prone to be developed. So when the developments went in, uh, the irrigation systems could be connected to the effluent. And they won all sorts of awards uh, from the um, EPA, uh, Irrigation Association, it was really a model. Um, and, uh, you know, after it had been in for four or five years, the uh, pumps that 
took the effluent water and put it into the effluent system, uh, they broke down. And when they broke down, three of the homes that had been built didn't have water pressure. Uh, and it became known that the plumbers hooked the drinking water supply to the effluent pipes, to the purple pipes that they shouldn't have done. Uh, so, so sort of, uh, you know, re really a, a concern. But the reason I sort of tell that story is, is that this family had drank and bathed and cooked with this effluent water for probably two or three years, um, and obviously went a lot under a lot of health testing, and they really found. I'm not suggesting that we drink that flow and water, but they really found no, uh, you know, permanent health uh, damage or concerns uh, from the situation. So uh, not not suggesting that we drink effluent water, but just tr sort of trying to purvey uh, how well that water can act, act, actually be treated. Um, I believe, um, at least in going back a number of years ago, um, a uh, the DEP actually had grants available to g golf courses if they were able to convert uh, their irrigation systems over to effluent water. You know, the problem is where are the sewer plants? You know, they're generally in an area that is certainly not next to a golf course, very often not surrounded by residential homes. Uh, and just the, uh, you know, the, the ability to, to, to try to get some sort of infrastructure to get that water from that plant instead of sending it out in the Raritan Bay or, you know, the Delaware River to be, um, you know, putting it where it can be useful by, uh, the landscape community. So, uh, great question. I w wish there were some plans to um, to, to do that. But, but uh, write your legislator. But I think that's something that we've looked at in our planning processes in the past. And, and just what Bob brought up is, you know, it's kind of proximity to those um, effluent discharge locations and, and the potential for land application or, you know, appropriate use. Um, there are lead design buildings, you know, if, if folks are looking at building new commercial buildings, um, you can get credits and, and you can reuse water in your facilities. Um, and, you know, typically in New Jersey, we have um, like a dye that's added if you use rainwater for toilet flushing and things like that. So there are rainwater uses um, in different corporate facilities. Our, our corporate headquarters in Camden does that. Um, so there's there's opportunities to do it on a small scale um, in the shorter term. A great question, Greg. Thank you. I'm not seeing other questions. Um, Bob, I had a question for you when you were going through um, describing the differences between like deep uh, irrigation for encouraging root growth. Um, I was just hoping you could elaborate on what do you mean when you, when you describe like deep versus light irrigation to encourage rooting? Um, how many minutes uh, would you say or what would a typical duration be for deep irrigation? So the duration is going to vary dramatically on the on the precipitation rate of the sprinkler head. When we have rotary sprinkler heads, just a typical application rate may be a third of an inch of water per hour. Uh, if we have spray heads, they can be, you know, two and a half inches or more per hour. So obviously, uh, we run the rotary heads for longer periods of time. Uh, Healthy, um, cool season turf grass, th this time of year, I, I don't know, maybe an average healthy root zone, um, you know, could be six inches, um, maybe eight inches or so. Um, if you're in clay soil, they're generally a little bit shallower. Uh, when you get into the summer months, that might um, shrink to, you know, three inches of root zone or so. Um, so, um, you know, the different soils have different water holding capacities. 
So if, if I have uh, sandy soil, even though the pore space in, in between the soil particles is larger, it has uh, very minimal uh, water holding capacity. Uh, gravity drains the water down from there. Um, if, if we get a really, really tight clay soil, uh, the pore spaces in between the soil particles are very, very small. And most of that water is really held tightly to the soil particle. Um, so it's really like sandy loam soils are the ones that can hold the largest uh, quantity of, of, uh, of water. Um, and that, that's usually measured in quantity of water per inch of depth or so. I don't have that information right uh, directly in, in, in front of me. But, uh, you know, for, for instance, if you were to, uh, you know, look to run, run an irrigation system and, and, and try to apply one inch of water at one particular application, with many of the soils, um, it's not going to be able to soil one inch of water in, in its plant root zone. There's just not sufficient space in there to do that. So th this is one of the um, discussions we had with um, uh, the Division of Water Resources with their recommendations, because we're saying, really, if you're going to try to apply one inch of water at one, one time, probably 30% uh, of that water or 40% of that water is not going to be beneficial to the plant because the root zone is already going to be filled up, and that water is going to percolate down into the deep root zone where you're going to end up uh, not being available to the plant material. The other thing I didn't point out that we should really um, consider, too, is we're not just talking about turf grass. We're talking about landscapes. So, you know, different plant material are, are going to have different uh, root zones. And if you have a deciduous tree, you know, that, that root zone can go down two or three feet or so. So, um, again, if you have extensive plantings of particularly new deciduous trees, trying to water those deeply, you really have to have a, a almost a drip system that puts out a very, very slow rate of water to allow that to, to penetrate down into the plant root zone. So, so I don't great. think I've fully answered your question, probably raised more questions than answers. <laughs> well, I, I think it, it's, it sounds like it's difficult to say how many minutes because it really is a function of what type of soil do you have? What type of um, planting is it? Um, Correct. And, and, and for the most part, I, I think most of our irrigation systems typically try to put down maybe a quarter or a third of an inch per, per, per application. Um, you know, and then frequencies, if you get into the very hot summer months, that's maybe not going to be enough to watering a couple times a week to uh, keep that plant healthy. So I, I'll tell you what's a very handy tool. Um, either a soil probe or a moisture meter. I particularly like a soil probe that uh, will pull out a, a little sphere of the soil and we can actually look at it. Um, you know, it's uh, it'll tell you an awful lot about what's happening to the irrigation water that you're applying and how effective it's, it's going to be. Well, that's a great tip. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate it. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat right now. Um, really appreciate everyone's time. I see we only have a couple minutes left. So um, if anyone has a question, please type it in. But um, if not, I'd just like to thank you again. And Bob and Lindsay, um, thank you everyone for joining us today and to help um, provide this educational webinar um, for our irrigation contractors and our customers. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone that um, engaged with us today and your interest in managing water more efficiently. Um, everyone that were registered for this uh, webinar will receive a copy of the webinar after this meeting is over. And um, we're here to help keep life flowing I hope everyone has a safe and wonderful weekend. Let me see, we got another question. Can you post the state ET site again? Um, I think we had that in one of our slides. Let me see if I can put that in the chat, the, uh, the URL where we have the ET data. 
Yeah, and, and I, I should point out that that I uh, or any of the links that were in the presentation, I, I wanted to make sure that they were all functioning and val valid. Uh, and the one for Rutgers did not work, but but I do know that uh, David Robinson, who's the state climatologist that oversees that, that typically when uh, we get out of the irrigation season, they um, I, I think they turn that feature off. But uh, I'll follow up and make sure that that's um, something that they're going to generate again. Uh, and again, if, if you were to Google Cornell uh, ET, I believe they have they have a site that uh, you know does uh, the, sort of the northeast area that will provide uh, a lot of the information. So well, that's great. Thanks for that question, um, Jim. So hopefully, I put the link in the chat there, and. Um, Thanks, Bob. All right, we're, we're just about at uh, 1030. So I'd like to thank everyone again. And uh, I hope you enjoy your weekend. Have a great irrigation season, everybody.